Thanks for everything. Thanks. Uh, Can we get a round of applause, please? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mazi. My name is Casey Ray Hunter. I'm from Future Music Coalition. We are a national nonprofit education, research, and advocacy organization right here in DC. Um, super excited that you guys braved the weather, like Mazi said. You are indeed brave souls, but I'm glad you did because I think this is going to be a really fascinating conversation. And before we get moving with that, I want to thank our co-hosts, Words, Beats, and Life. Um, we love them to pieces. It's always a treat to collaborate with them. I also want to thank the staff of Future of Music Coalition, especially Kristen Thompson and Chaya Kapadia, Nicole Duffy for all their work in putting together this event, and other stops on Peter's uh, book tour. And also to thank Peter himself, because he's really got an incredible piece of work on his hands here with Creative License. And just to let you know, there are copies in the bookstore over there, and I've been told that Peter will even sign them, um, which is kind of amazing. And Webalicious is doing the live webcast. You can see this um, on the internet at futureofmusic.org. And if, you're, if uh, you guys wandered in at some point, I don't know when everyone got here, but if you just want to make sure that you've um, checked in and signed in at the table, that'd be great, just so we can um, track you and know your whereabouts in the future. Just kidding, we're not really going to do that. Um, we're here to talk about, this, about sampling culture and some of the uh, legal and marketplace conventions that have shaped its evolution. But we're also here to talk about hip hop. And I'm really glad about that too because yesterday we did one of these events and it was all a bunch of lawyers. So I'm super psyched to be able to, to kind of bring this back to a conversation about music which is you know, really the, the reason why we're all here. My organization, Future of Music Coalition, or our organization, Future of Music Coalition, has been looking at the impact of technology and on creativity and artist compensation for more than a decade. And to me, there's absolutely no better example of that than sampling culture, which rose from a DIY expression to a big money and big lawsuit phenomenon. No matter what your opinion is about the legal and ethical aspect about sampling, one thing is absolutely true. It is an art form. And in my course of uh, reading Creative License, I was struck by just how many incredible records use sampling as their backbone. And for so many of us, those records are the soundtracks to our lives. Um, I can still remember the first time I heard Public Enemies, It Takes a Nation of Millions, and I think I literally stopped and said, what the fuck is that sound? Um, and I kept going back to it, and years later, I'm still trying to figure out what the F is that sound and, and you know, the amazing stuff that Hank Shockley and the rest of the Bomb Squad put together. But I'm really glad that they did put it together because it, it changed lives. Uh, at, at Future of Music, we're really concerned at the end of the day about balance. We know that musicians aren't a monolithic group, and they have a whole range of opinions about pretty much everything, including sampling. And that's why we're always trying to include them in discussions about policy and music business models and so on and so forth. And so another reason that we're really impressed with uh, Peter and Ken Brew's book is that it puts those musician voices front and center. And you know that's where when you're discussing complicated stuff like sampling and copyright, that's kind of the, where you're going to get the most insight, in, in my opinion. There's probably no one-size-fits-all solution to all the issues around the sampling situation, but it's very impressive that Peter and Kembrew have presented such an important history of, of sampling and also an important history of hip-hop and still managed to present some really uh, interesting in, uh, ways forward. So we're going to kick off with a little Q&A between Peter and myself, and then we're all going to sit down for a panel discussion with DJ Roddy Rod and uh, DJ Two-Tone Jones, uh, who are in the house. And so with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Peter DeCola, a professor at Northwestern University and co-author of Creative License. Wow, oh, thanks. thanks. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Wow, that's, that's the you, one. You can keep going. Oh my God, thank you so much. Um, we can just applaud the whole time. Uh, so how did you get interested in sampling? Um, so I got interested in sampling um, uh, on an airplane, sitting with uh, Jenny Toomey, who's been kind enough to be here, our former executive director of Future Music Coalition. We were talking about um, 
copyright. We were on our way to a conference about copyright, and I got interested in it uh, in terms of like from a research perspective because it was a um, particular context in which you could study how copyright is actually stifling creativity. Uh, and we'd heard stories about records you can't make anymore because of the way copyright law had evolved, and that intrigued me. And I'd read in law school some of these sampling cases and thought some of them were right and some of them were wrong. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we had this idea to do this project. We'd heard, we'd heard about a similar project out of American University about documentary film, where they interviewed actual practitioners about how it was done. And, and so um, in that conversation, we sort of hatched this plan that we were going to rope Kembrew into this project and start interviewing musicians and producers and lawyers about sampling. So that was the initial part. I mean, I've been, I know I've been listening to sampling since I was, you know, right. in, in junior high and high school, you know, because it's, it, sampling happens in every genre, right. hip, hip hop and electronica, I'm down. Well, but. that's why it seems kind of counterintuitive because, uh, you know, you have like this collage art going all the way back to the, the avant-garde composers of the you know, early 20th century, all the way up through the golden age of hip hop. Um, you know, the Beatles were using found sound. I mean, this is not like a, a new thing. Uh, so it's kind of surprising to me, you know, in looking at the book that uh, I hadn't come across anything that tried to put this stuff into a cultural and legal context. So why, first of all, why do you think that is and why is it important to even do that work? Well, I think it's important to put it in context because uh, lawyers definitely aren't musicians and policymakers aren't all musicians. Some of them are. Once in a while we meet a, a harmonica playing FCC commissioner or something God like bless that. Me. But um, the, you know, I, I think that it's so, the, the, so much of what judges are asked to do in these copyright cases involves, as much as they want to pretend that it doesn't, involves making aesthetic judgments. Right. and. So if you don't put sampling in a context where you say, listen, this is how music is made. Music gets made because people borrow from and build on and use the past and existing, they use existing works. And if that isn't understood, that there's a continuum from you know, covering a song to quote, you know, making a little quotation or allusion or playing something in the style of the song, then the judges are going to get it wrong, or Congress is going to get it wrong. So we, and you know, and, and so I think that that's the most important reason we do that. You know, um, I also think that it helps when, you know, sometimes when I'm presenting this work and talking to students, they say, well, you know, isn't this stuff just derivative? You know, because copyright has yeah. this term, derivative work, if yeah. you build from something else, right? And people take that not. I mean, it's it's meant as just a technical term. It's not meant as like an aesthetic judgment. You know? <laughs> but people take it that way, right? And so you have to explain, no, 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 no. Just because it built on something, that just means it's music, you know, it doesn't mean that it's any better or worse. Another unique thing about uh, doing any of that kind of transformation or, or building with uh, musical sounds is that uh, music has two copyrights. It's, we're not just talking about the notes on paper, which is, is one part, uh, the underlying composition, there's also the sound recording. And, uh, you know, can you describe a little bit uh, uh, some, some of the differences and Sure. So, you know, the musical composition is the sheet music uh, and the lyrics. Um, and the, that has been protected going all the way back, actually. It was uh, explicitly protected in, like, 1830, but really from the, the founding and the first Copyright Act, um, that because it's written and because it's a written work, uh, it's been thought to have an author and be, you know, worthy of being owned. And, and in the early history of the music industry, as we know it, um, Composers had all the power. You know, they that you think of uh, Tin Pan Alley, you think of you know George Gershwin, Irving Berlin. They, composers were powerful. They were the ones who had the talent. And then you know, yeah, someone would sing their song for them, or they'd find some different singers. Um, gradually, though, as um, recording technology progressed, then um, there became pressure because of piracy, pirated recordings, um, bootlegs, things like that to protect the sound recording itself. And I think also there was probably some recognition that the live performers are adding something unique right. and uh, worthy of protection. So then Congress, and, and this is amazing how much later it is, uh, not until 1972 right. did, the, uh, was, did there become federal protection for sound recordings. And the sound recording, it can ha be a recording of a composition, mm -hmm. or it could be a recording of found sounds. Like you can be the, an author of a sound recording where you just go outside and record traffic. Where and it so doesn't have an underlying. It might not have an underlying composition. Usually it does. And so a lot of things that are sampled then implicate these two rights where you've sampled the underlying notes. Let's say you sample a, a, a five note snatch of a recording. Right. The five notes in the sheet music, the owner of that has their rights implicated, but then also the owner of the particular recording of the five notes that you happen to use in your sample. 
those that those, so you've got these two owners. Now we're probably not going to be able to get too into the weeds about sure. looking at the you know actual case law that defines how the samples are you know used and, and, and what's licensable and so on and so forth. But the composition side, it seems like it's a little bit more liberal about what you can, can get away with in terms of length of, of what you're borrowing and so on and so forth. But on the on the sound copyright side, the, the, the music that's actually captured on, you know, wax or tape or CD, uh, there's much less flexibility in the eyes of the law. Right? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that characterization. I think so, and this is where the analogy between musical compositions and written works, I think, helps. So just like no one person can own a word, uh, mm -hmm. much as they might try with the trademark law, um, uh, at least as far as copyright goes, you can't own a word or a short phrase. And that the same goes for musical compositions. So no one owns, you know, C, no one owns the sequence C, D, going up a, a right. whole step, you know. Um, and then once you have three notes, uh, as we learned in this case involving the Beastie Boys, if you have C, D flat, C, well then we have to go to federal appellate court to argue <laughs> about whether that's something uh -huh. that can be owned or not. And um, it turns out it really can, or at least in the that Ninth case. Circuit said that it cannot. Yeah, three notes is still a build, a basic, what they call a basic building block, um, and and so that um, that. Our conception is that that can't be owned. That that's too short a snippet. But if to we own. were talking those three notes played by somebody captured on, a, on in fixed media, right? In a sound recording, what the courts have said, or at least what one court said that's ruled on this specific issue, is that no matter how much you take of a sound recording, it's copyright infringement unless you fall into this one exception uh, called fair use. But um, the court sort of suggested they punted on that, right? Yeah, the court sort of suggested that. They didn't really think that defense would apply, but they didn't say that. Uh, they, but, the, but the point is just that no matter how much you take of a sound recording, someone can sue you, and uh, the owner can sue you, and uh, then you can sort of fight it out over this defense of right. fair use. Now, that's a really important thing to know because there's a lot of interesting folk wisdom around sampling, like the se seven second rule or the seven beat rule, which kind of reminds me of like what we used to talk about when I was a kid. like. You know, the Denny's seven second rule, the Denny's the restaurant, like you drop it on the floor and you pick it up, but before like 10 or seconds or whatever, you can still serve it. And by the way, that rule is observed in my household to this day. Uh, but uh, is any of that stuff actually true for sampling on any level? Should we just say first that that's not true for Denny's and we didn't in any really? way need to imply that? I don't, I don't know. Do you have I, any, can you, yeah, can you, whoever their general citations? counsel is, like, yeah. I just want to apologize. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so maybe they'll sue us. Yeah, no, this folk wisdom, that, it's very interesting. Not, I mean, folk wisdom comes from uh, folks, right? It just comes from people. Folk wisdom also comes from the industry. We have two types, right? We have the folk wisdom that says, oh, yeah, you can use five seconds and that's fine, or you can, you can take four notes or whatever. And uh, the copyright law doesn't draw any kind of bright line, right? The defense of, of fair use, for instance, we won't get into the weeds, but just it's a, it's a murky kind of case-by-case -case determination. Uh, some people argue about how murky it is, but I, I think it's pretty Can murky. Can you quickly describe for uh, the benefit of yeah. uh, our viewers and our audience sure. like, what fair use is? Yeah, well, fair use is, is, a, um, is a defense for educational uses. Uh, it's, it's a defense for commentary. So if you're a book reviewer and you want to take a quote from a book uh, while you're reviewing it, that would, that would count as fair use. Uh, I, as an educator, take advantage of fair use to show images or talk about copyrighted works that are involved in cases. Um, courts look at you know how much you took, whether it's right. commercial or not, whether you're hurting the market for that work. Um, you know, basically, you like can that. only use that if somebody sues you and yeah, says it's you're infringing. Right? It, exactly, it's, it's a, a defense. defense, and it, it's different for every case. So there's right. no. This is sort of the difference between having like a, a set rule and then just having sort of a mushier standard of sure. judging whether something's okay or not. So yeah, there aren't any rule. It turns out there aren't any hard and fast rules for how much you can use in sampling. Yeah. There's just nothing that the, the uh, creators don't get the benefit of that kind of clarity. Uh, and that's, that's one thing the book is about. Now, the in, you know, like I said, the industry is a supplier of folk wisdom as well to suggest, uh -huh. oh, you have to get permission for everything. Now, that may not be true. Some samples might be fair use. You might fall into defense. Maybe you took so little or maybe you transformed it so much that it almost becomes a commentary on the original work and it becomes analogous to like a reviewer uh, commenting sure. on it and, ch and, and changing its meaning. And, you know, fair use is a doctrine such that we, that, you know, we want the public to comment on the works of others. Right. Right? And so that, that's a congressional policy. It's enshrined in the copyright statute. 
And so when people say, oh yeah, all sampling that's unauthorized is illegal, that's that's not true either. That's folk wisdom that, you know. Well, and, and I wanna I wanna ask you about that because uh, you know, you can't paint the industry with one brush, just like you can't no, paint the industry enough. with one brush. But there are people out there who say that sampling is not creative, and worse than that, they say it's straight up theft. And how would you respond to that? Yeah, theft is strong. Uh, I wouldn't use that word. I mean, I think that, and I think the part about it not being creative is just totally off base. So I think that just like, um, you know, you can do something really creative with a guitar or you could do something really uncreative with a guitar. You could do something creative with your voice or something uncreative with your voice. I think, I think sampling is a tool, it's a technique. It can be used to make incredible stuff. It could be used in a way that people judge as aesthetically, you know, not interesting. But uh, you know, it's—I it, don't think it's any different from any other musical right. tool. Um, well, I mean, and I think that this is backed up uh, not just by the, you know, folks who buy records and, and love records, but you know, Public Enemy's uh, uh, "Fear of a Black Planet" I think is recognized by the Library of Congress as a, <laughs> as a you know, important cultural work, and I think. Uh, De La Soul's Three Sheet and Rising just got that designation as well uh, as, uh, you know, recently as last week or something. Mm. And, you know, to me that's another bit of, like, disconnect. Like, how can this be recognized by the Library of Congress uh, and still be, th these records still be not legit in the eyes of the law? What's oh, the well, that, well, that's, you know what, what's funny is the law is a little, so the law has some stuff that's on the side of the, pe you know, the sam the people who are sampled, the, right. we call them the samplees, maybe. But the law also has some stuff that benefits samplers or recognizes what uh, samplers are doing. So, in addition to these exceptions that might, you know, that, that uh, maybe sampling is fair use in some cases. The other thing is that you can copyright a compilation if it's a, if it's original enough, if it's creative enough. So, if in, in, uh, a compilation just means a selection or arrangement of other copyrighted works. So, for instance, you know. Um, uh, some databases, if they're organized in a really interesting or useful way, uh, can be recognized with, for copyright protection. So I think that even copyright law on the books recognizes that if you take samples and then add your own stuff and rearrange things in an interesting way, you're selecting the samples, you're arranging them interestingly, those, those are, that's worthy of copyright. That's something that Congress but is encouraging. But if Public Enemy wanted to reissue Fear of a Black Planet, yeah. And put it in the marketplace, they'd run into all. Yeah, that. so that's where the, that's one of the big problems we focus on in the book is to get back to this issue of records you can't make anymore. Uh, I think it, so. The problem for records like Fear of a Black Planet and Beastie Boys' Paul's Boutique is that they are sampling so many songs per track um, that there's a there's just an enormous number of licenses they need to get. And a lot of the book is about the legality and the business aspect of that, about how hard it is to get licenses and how how much it would cost to sort of go through that process. But okay, let's say that you're sampling like 20 songs in one track, so that's two copyright owners each, potentially, yep. or potentially more, sure. uh, depending on how the rights have been sliced and diced. So let's say it's a, at least 40 licenses you have to get, 20 compositions, 20 sound recordings. Then the problem is that the way prices are stated is usually in percentage terms or in terms of pennies out of your royalty rate. And so composers are used to uh, royalty rates of owning 25, 50, sometimes 100% of the new recording. So as soon as you've sampled, you know, if the rate is 25%, as soon as you've sampled five things, you owe 125 percent. You call that royalty stacking. Yeah, book, call it, right? yeah, we call it royalty stacking. You can call it, um, you know, um, by weird. fancier legal names that you know, you call like, it, like you call it an anti-commons problem. You can call it just uh, no pie left to give out of the revenue pie from your record. And so, uh, in the book, we go and figure out, like, so what would happen if you tried to license Public Enemy's Fear of the Black Planet or Beastie Boys Paul's Boutique, and the answer is you'd lose a few dollars with every record, right? Because you'd owe so much in royalties to everyone, you're owing a huge percentage of every song uh, to the point where it exceeds how much you're taking in. Public Enemy would be in the whole what were your, your back of the envelope calculations was close to like twenty million dollars. Yeah, something? so like eight bucks a copy, and they sold uh, two and a half million copies. Oh no, that was Beast Boys. Beast Boys oh, Beast sold Boys. two and a half million copies of Paul's Boutique, and so they, eight bucks a copy that would be a lot. And then Public Enemy, we figured they'd lose about five and a half dollars per copy, and right. they sold about a million two point two five, and so they'd be out about seven million dollars if they paid if they released the record, had as much success with it as they did, but paid the royalty rates as the industry would would uh, you know as the going rates would suggest. Now that's a bit of a like a fantastical calculation. Right. It's just as you said, a back. You're using it thing. as an example. 
it's an example because the truth is that you just couldn't make the records. The truth is that some of those people that you sampled are going to say no. And under the law, they, as it is currently interpreted by the courts, it, they'd have the right to say no and just say, yeah, I'm sorry, we're, you, can't, you have to take that sample out. And so there's no, actually no way that those records could exist as is if someone put them together in the studio today and then tried to release them in the commercial marketplace. Sure. So then that leads you to the issue of, well, where would it go if someone did make that? Right. And, the just, and then it just goes to the underground economy. You, you release it on the internet, you don't charge money for it, you try to make money on your live performance. And you duck in covers. Yeah, or you get really sophisticated, like this guy from Pittsburgh, uh, Greg Gillis, who goes by Girl Talk, and you uh, learn a lot, a lot about copyright law, and you say, I believe in this fair use defense. I think I can take advantage of it for all 400 and samples. You stare them down. <laughs> and you stare them down, yeah. exactly. And you call your record label illegal art. And you get a guy who operates under a pseudonym to run it to make the lawsuit just a little bit harder. And yeah. then you say, okay, I'm going to call this fair use. And, come, and go so ahead and far, that in that game of chicken, uh, nobody He's winning is, so yeah. far. Yeah, yeah. and I wish, him, I wish him luck, actually. It's really interesting. I mean, as much as, like, as a law professor, I'd love to hear that fair use case where, you know, I, sure. I, but for his sake, I really don't want Girl Talk to have to go on trial for his right. music. So, um, you know, he may end up serving as, as an example of... Um, you know, artists claiming fair use and claiming these rights. I actually almost think that would be a shame, though. In a way, I'd like to see a system show up where the creators can get compensated somewhat, mm -hmm. but just not in such, to such excess that the samplers are losing money when they make collages, yeah. right? You know, I so mean, that's, that, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, one thing that's good about, uh, you know, the recognition of the rights in both the composition and in the sound copyright uh, is that it creates the opportunity for a legitimate marketplace where, uh, you know, the folks who actually created, hopefully the folks that actually created uh, the original sound that's being sampled can be compensated and then the samplers can release stuff without being, uh, you know, sued into submission. Um, but what your book kind of describes is how that marketplace for licensing doesn't always run so smoothly. Yeah. Can you describe to us real quickly where you think the friction exists? Sure. So, yeah, I think that's a great word too, friction in the system. That's the one we like to use. It's, um, I stole it from you. Thanks. I sampled um, it. Excellent. So uh, some of the friction comes because you have to be sophisticated enough to understand that you need to learn about this system. So right. there's, a, there's a bit of a cost there. Um, there's some friction in that you have to have the right kind of relationships. So if you're operating outside the major label system, it's going to be a lot harder to navigate the licensing system. It's going to be hard to know who owns what. It's going to be hard to know the customs of how these negotiations work. Uh, it's going to be hard to know whether you're getting sort of suckered on the prices or not mm -hmm. um, you, if you don't have as much experience with what the going rates usually are. And so um, there's all these hurdles that come through. The other thing is that licensing can just take a long time. Yeah. So in the major label system, you can lose your release window. Or not, that's even true for some indies, right, that they've got certain slots where they're like, all right, we're going to release a record the first week of May. And if it's going to be yours, the licenses have to be, you know, obtained by that time. And so you can, we heard from people about, some of the people we interviewed talked about this problem. If you miss your slot and all of a sudden your record gets released three, three months later, six months later. So, and, or sometimes you, you have to go back and alter it because someone refuses to, to license. The other thing, when some people might say, okay, why don't you, I, I get this question a lot in law schools. Everyone says, well, why don't you just license all the samples in advance? How well, the reason, know? and the reason is, that first of all, you have to know what you want to use. Yeah. But another reason is that the the person who owns the copyrights that you're infringing uh, potentially by sampling them, uh, they want to hear what you did. Mm -hmm. They want to hear what the sample is going to sound like in context. They want information about whether they think it's a good recording that reflects well on them. So there's this like uh, there are these aesthetic concerns that come in. Sometimes it's political. Um, Sometimes people just uh, don't like certain genres of music um, and just sort of don't want their stuff to be used in that. Um, and so that, you know, that creates um, that creates some friction as well because you have to be ready with at least some kind of demo to pass along to someone through these channels to get them to approve, uh, approve your sample. And what effect does that have on creativity? Because we talk about the records that can't be made, but what's the upshot of that? Are, are, you know, there's probably no way to prove that there's been a ton of records that weren't made, but we do know <laughs> that, 
you know, hip hop has kind of taken particularly a, an, another turn. And maybe it would have taken that turn anyway, aesthetically. I mean, every genre is allowed to mature, evolve, and grow. But uh, it is definitely true that the hip hop records um, that we hear now that are mainstream hip hop records are, are different than the ones that were released in the golden age of hip hop. Right. I know. I think that's right. And, you know, it's interesting. We try to talk in the book and be fair and say that there are some things that people have done to be really creative and invent around this. Uh, this system, but there are other people, right, who their method of creation or just certain methods of creation that they would prefer to use are just no longer available to them. Right. And so they f have to find other ways to express themselves or, you know, uh, you know, shift towards a live musicians doing. Can you describe replays? I mean, that's kind of sure. Interesting so, too. one little technique you can use is all right, you've got two licenses to get the yeah. composition, the sound recording. You can save yourself one of those by taking the melody you want to sample and just hiring a musician to play it right. for you. Sometimes that doesn't achieve the sound you want um, of the old recording, but... Like uh, rapping over a scratchy record is a sound Yeah, record. but, you, but it, it's something that... It's, it's, it's one way that you can deal with gotcha. the problem, and we heard from people, you know, about that. Um, you talk to a lot of people in general, like there's like some um, just the book is just filled with quotes of, you know, some key players and, you know, everybody from musicians to label owners to, uh, you know, lawyers and folks who work in the industry. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who do you think gave the most interesting responses? And it's oh, being taped. So if you want to give us a spread. I'm always going to say Hank Shockley. I mean, Hank Shockley from Public Enemy, um, both because he can talk about the creative process and because his ideas about um, the economics and the, the law of it. Like, he's so good at articulating the frustrations in the studio and, like, how this is such a weird market because he's trying to build things out of stuff, right? He needs inputs. Yeah. And yet, the people who are selling him the inputs won't tell him the price up front. And right. so he'll say things like, you know, I need a menu. Give me a menu. Yeah. Tell me how yeah. much for a hi hat, how much yeah. for a baseline, you know? And, He's right, you know, uh, samplers have this hard, this really difficult environment to operate in where they're taking on all this risk of not being able to license things sure. and they don't know how high the price is going to get. And so I think he captures that really well. So yeah, he's, he's, he's one of my favorites. He's probably, he's probably at the top of the yeah, list. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, it, it, the frustration is definitely apparent. <laughs> but it, it's great because the frustration, he asks questions within that frustration mm -hmm. that are actually really helpful. and. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know how much uh, that type of thing informed um, the book has like some perspective ways forward or, or some ideas about how we might be able to address some of these persistent issues or frictions in the sample licensing system. Um, can you describe some of those? Sure. One of the things that would be great that an increasing number of copyright policymakers and academics are agreeing on is that we need some kind of um, registry or what we call an authentication database, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, we need Knowing to know who, who owns, owns what. what. Yeah. And just like for land, think of it like land. Like if you've ever bought a condo or something or, or bought land, uh, you, you, um, you, know, you have title in the land. There's like a, someone's keeping track. There's a recorder of deeds, mm -hmm. you know, and like we need that for copyright. We used to have it. We got rid of it for reasons uh, of international law. We wanted to join some treaties. Other countries didn't have a registry. They see it as a big burden on copyright owners to have to announce themselves that they own things. And it can be a burden for people like photographers who are generating enormous numbers of work. So if we can't do but, it, if, if the U.S. law doesn't say uh, we can do it because of the international things, it would have to be a voluntary thing. But the Copyright Office can encourage, encourage people it. to use it or set it up and say it's voluntary, but it right. would be great. For, so that would reduce, you can see how that would reduce the hurdles for people coming from the system from the outside, right? If they knew where to go, who to ask. At least you could get a no quicker, right. uh, or maybe you could get a yes and, and, and quicker and, and figure out a rate. So that's one of the more practical things I think we talked about. What else, uh, it, you know, I don't want to spoil the ending, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, there are other things that courts could do, like, so the court that said that no matter how much you sample, uh, it's copyright infringement. Uh, another court, whoever got that case, ideally would you know, decide it differently. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm really restraining my frustration with that decision sure. here. I'm trying to speak, um, you know, respectfully of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. But um, You're allowed to have Which opinion. my students know I'm not usually able to do. But um, I, I just think that, the, that there really could be a really small amount, even if it were a tenth of a second, would actually give some samplers a little bit of room because some people really are just looking for the sound of something and then they're right. going to filter it and change it and transform it. Right. And so there could be a little bit of room for sampling and collage, even if you just said, 
that some samples are too small to be copyrighted. But as the law stands right now. As the law stands right now, no in the Sixth Circuit, it's definitely, there's no such uh, allowance in the other circuits. It remains to be seen. Uh, you know, so the, and it's, it, you're not seeing a lot of cases coming right. up over this. It, it's very expensive to litigate and defend this principle, and so no one has done that yet. Do you have any uh, a personal view of like how, like if you were going to build the perfect uh, sampling environment? Oh, man. Um, I, I don't know. I think that um, it's really complicated because there are some sam every sample is a little bit different. You know, I can see yeah. why there's a, there's pressure for a case by case determination yeah. or an instance by instance Tailored. determination because some samples really are long, and people anyone who heard it would say they're long, they're recognizable, and some hooks are more the, desirable the too. Yeah, right? the artist who's using it, it can, is wealthy and can afford it, and you think, yeah, we should move money to the person who got sampled here. We should we should sure. pay them. There are other situations where I think it shouldn't. I, I think that it might be helpful to have. That's why I like the idea of just a short, at least these really tiny samples. That would be at least something we could just say as a bright line, sure. you know, that that's okay and give some breathing room right off the bat. I want to get the other guys up here in just a second, but uh, there was one last thing in the book that I found really interesting um, that, that you touched on, and it might be a good segue into, into the next conversation. So much of what we talk about when we talk about sampling is based on Western ideas of copyright, which to a large degree is focused focused on rhythm, uh, excuse me, focused on melody mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and lyrics. Uh, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's, that's used as the building blocks for, uh, you know, sampling based records that's based on rhythms or bass lines and other things. And that really complicates the idea of authorship as we see in the case of, say, somebody like Clyde Stubblefield, who was James Brown's drummer and is possibly the most sampled guy you know, or one of the most sampled uh, musicians in history. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about his situation and how, uh, you know, uh, oh, attribution sure. is an important part. It's not just it's not just compensation, but attribution. Right. A lot of artists we talked to, you know, and Clyde is one of them, said, you know, what I really would have liked would be just my name on the record, just yeah. a little, or, or maybe maybe a little thanks, you know, <laughs> a little acknowledgement. Uh, U.S. copyright law doesn't work that way, though. Right. There's no requirement to acknowledge the people you use. You have to pay them if you're infringing their copyright, but you don't have to give attribution. And so... Um, but he's not considered a songwriter in But that. he is outside of... Right. He is not a copyright holder. For one he reason was, or another. He was in James Brown's band. James Brown was in charge of that enterprise, you know, and uh, Clyde was paid for his time in the studio, he was, you know, in a way. He's a member of the band, kind of functions almost like a session musician, even yeah. though he was with the band, you know, for a, a few years, uh, some of the prime years of James Brown's career. But he's not... Uh, you know, just that's just the business arrangement of James Brown and his record label that you know uh, that Clyde is not a copyright owner. Right, but it's really just it's it's interesting though because everybody wants to build off the beat and and it's such a significant part of of what attracts people to the James Brown sound and 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 you know makes it so attractive for use in in uh, you know hip hop and other types of music. Well, and it gets complicated because, you know, the law, copyright lawyers, you know, I talk like there's this neat division between the composition and the sound recording. Uh -huh. It's not really that simple. There, it's, It can be very hard to figure out, okay, is rhythm part of the composition or exactly. is the way the rhythm was played? And if you're just a little behind the beat, does that make it part of the performance? Is that part of the sound recording copyright? Those sure. cases can get really complicated. And, yeah, our, our copyright isn't designed to handle this. Right. That's fascinating. Uh, let's get the other guys uh, up here and, and we'll, you know, broaden the conversation. I can stop talking for a while.